دع الأيام تفعل ما تشاء وطب نفسا إذا حكم القضاء ولا تجزع لحادثة الليالي فما لحوادث الدنيا بقاء So, inshallah, we'll move straight on to the program. Um, brothers and sisters, uh, inshallah, we'll move on to straight on to the next part of the program, which is where we have um, the, the main line topic of Imam Shamin. So, Imam Shamin and Dagestan um, goes hand in hand. And those brothers and sisters who may not know about Imam Shamin, um, inshallah, we will be enlightened um, by uh, Sheikh. Um, but just to introduce Sheikh Yasser Khadi, I know he may interrupt me. Uh, like no, Sheikh no, if you're not going to introduce no. Sheikh Khadi, because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people need to know more and they know about Sheikh Yasser but they need to know more so they can benefit from, from لا, no, honestly, knowledge. if Sheikh Haytham was not introduced then I cannot be introduced either um, you, you can mention you can mention that uh, I am a scuba diver and I like uh, ice cream and uh, yes. I'm uh, Biryani, uh, Biryani. father of Four teenagers, so you can mention all of this, inshallah. Yeah. Okay, inshallah. inshallah. And, I can begin yeah, immediately. I, if you want. I, I, I can say that he is one of our uh, greatest yeah. scholars in the West, mashallah. Yeah. We have to be honest here. Our we have to be, it's right. not false modesty. Our yeah. Western Muslim should know that all of us uh, are really nothing compared to our teachers, but because Allah has tested us with language that our teachers do not have. And because we have to multitask, you know, our teachers, they have the luxury of specialization, right? As you know, Sheikh Ghana, you can be a, a faqih and don't need to know anything about hadith back there. And you can be a muhaddith and not know anything about tafsir. But because of our occupation, we have to do everything. So we are tawaylib ilm in many yeah, disciplines and we are not actual mashayikh in anyone. At least I speak for myself. You know, I know Sheikh Haytham is, of course, in siyasa, he is yani sheikh al-kul fil kul. No, no, no. Uh, يعني, and uh, honestly, يعني, honestly, one, Sheikh Yasser is يعني, uh, one of the most knowledgeable peer, people in the West. And alhamdulillah, يعني, you can hear his lectures. It is not a, a testimony from myself, but listen to his lectures and you can see the amount of uh, ilm, mashallah, that is there. And he takes, mashallah, every subject seriously. Uh, I remember a number of times, يعني, I wanted just to listen to maybe one or two minutes um, to, to, uh, to what he said about something, two minutes, and I cannot resist, but I continue listening to the entire lecture. And then after that, I say, Allah, يهديك, ya Sheikh Yasser. <laughs> so if you force me to be with you for that. Okay, one time I remember your interview, one of your interviews, uh, for uh, I think 90 minutes, I could not resist but listen to it all. Yeah, benefiting from your yeah. ilm, from yeah. wisdom. Yeah. We ask Allah Jalla wa Ala ikhlas, yeah. all of us. Exactly. We ask Allah Jalla wa Ala ikhlas. Yeah. Ikhlas. Yeah. ikhlas and, and, yes. Yes. and I always and benefit from Sheikh Haytham's presence, Sheikh Suleiman's presence. Exactly. We always Allah benefit. Exactly. Together, we are Allah all Allah. together, we strengthen each other, inshallah, Sheikh. Yes, yes. yes. Sheikh Suleiman, Sheikh Suleiman, <laughs> Taban, he is. No, I just wanted to welcome Sheikh Yasir. Jazakallah, Sheikh Haytham. And I just obviously, very, what was very special. You know, when this program was set in Dagestan, and really, uh, I'm also grateful to my son, Mohammed uh, Madani. He has really uh, helped to, to support uh, this type of program and initiatives. And, uh, you know, Qadr Allah, I was going through some of my old video clips, and there was one clip I always knew I had it somewhere, and that was my meeting with Sheikh Yasser in front of Al-Aqsa. And it was only two days ago I, I, I found it, and... Uh, Really unbelievable. Always had that in my mind. What happened to that video club? And that was very special meeting where, you know, we you know part of the benefit of travel, as Sheikh Hissam, you explained, was we are meeting Sheikh Yasser right in front of uh, Jamia Masjid Al-Qibli. A uh, very yes. touching moment. And that is why, just like how Allah Ta'ala has made it possible that we meet in that location, in that place, and our love for Masjid Al-Aqsa. May Allah unite us all again. Amen. Amen. Uh, and that we'll never know, we might uh, go on a very special journey. May we have the likes of you, great uh, ulama and scholars, Sheikh Haysam, Sheikh Hasir. May Allah continue. Inshallah, we will organize program. something yeah. like. Yeah. Inshallah. And I pass it on to Sheikh Yasir, uh, Inshallah. 
Insha'Allah. So, uh, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu wa Salam ala Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wa lahamma ba'd. Uh, it is humbling to speak in the presence of uh, our giants and mashayikh. Um, and inshallah, the goal is really to benefit from uh, from each other and to benefit all of you. Uh, very briefly, because again, this is so much that can be done here. Uh, Imam al-Shamil is a name that is almost a household name uh, amongst many, many Muslims. However, we might have heard of his name, but we haven't really, or many of us haven't really uh, studied his life and times. And in this brief lecture, just 20, 25 minutes, inshallah, I wanted to just highlight some of the main things that we can benefit from uh, Imam al-Shamil's life. And one of the things that I, I, I think is very pertinent is that Imam al-Shamil, Imam Shamil is not somebody that is a thousand years ago. He is, in fact, a part of modernity. This is colonization. The Russians are colonizing his lands, right? So we're talking about, you know, 150, 200 years ago. It's not like we're talking about a thousand years ago. And so we're talking about a time frame that is really connected with our own. It's not the ancient past. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Imam Shamil comes from a region that uh, we've already been exposed to, Dagestan, which is really a part of the 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 Qawqaz or the Caucasus uh, uh, mountains and the, the Qawqaz uh, region, it used to be ruled by the Sassanid the Persians before the coming of Islam. Uh, and in the time of Ubud ibn Khattar, an, that's when the expansions began. So Islam was introduced to this region in the time of the Khulafa or Rashidun. Uh, but of course, uh, this region has always had strong ties with the uh, Ummah. In fact, this region has always been known for its fierce warriors, for its uh, class of fighters. And that is why uh, the Caucasus region was one of the main regions where uh, the sultans and the khulafa would import, you know, special uh, militias from uh, the the Janissaries. The Janissaries are called in English, right? They used to come from this uh, this region as well, and the, many of them formed the private guards of the salatin and of the, uh, the, 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 the khulafa. And in fact, many of the, uh, the, the mothers of our khulafa, of the Abbasids, and especially of the Ottomans, they came from this region as well. And so this region has had strong ties with the ummah for the last 14 centuries. Uh, the majority of people of Dagestan are Muslim, around 85% um, are, are Muslim, and they are basically Sunni Muslim as well. Uh, but there's a small percentage of, uh, of Christians and some other faith traditions as well. And uh, pre-modernity, before the Russian expansion, Dagestan had been nominally under the Qajar rule of, uh, of uh, Iran at the seventh century. Uh, but the Russians have had their eyes on this region for many centuries. Uh, in fact, from the time of Ivan the Great or Ivan the Terrible, he's called. Uh, that was the first time of the 15th century where they the, the Russians began their expansions into other territories. But it was during the time of, of Catherine the Great um, uh, in the 18th century where the actual expansionist streak began. And at this time, although Islam was a majority, it wasn't a strong majority. So we're going back to the 1700s now before Imam Shamil, uh, where, where Catherine the Great was uh, the first actual leader to invade uh, Dagestan, and this provoked the Muslims uh, to counter this, uh, this aggression. And the first major figure of that region by the name of Sheikh Mansour Ushurma, Sheikh Mansour Ushurma, who died 1794, he was the first person to stand up and to organize uh, a jihad against the, uh, the Russians. And he too was a, a Naqshbandi uh, scholar who uh, gathered together a militia and he defended uh, his lands from Catherine the Great. And uh, Sheikh Mansour uh, is well respected to this day in the land of Dagestan. He's considered to be in one of the main icons, you know, of that uh, of that region. Uh, interesting story with Sheikh Mansour is that his da'wah to uh, fight against uh, Catherine the Great actually was a cause of many people embracing Islam. Uh, because at the time, there were many non-Muslim, the pagans, the animists, you know, the ancient religions, they were still there. And he said that if they wanted victory against uh, Catherine, uh, and he was the main uh, political force that was defending his hometown, he converted the people by telling them if they wanted victory from Allah, they had to convert to Islam. They had to stop their evil ways. The, there were many drunkards, they were drinking and evil habits and whatnot. And he said that only if they convert to Islam and they live a good lifestyle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them a victory. So in fact, Islam spread as a result of 
anti-colonization as a result of opposing Catherine the Great and Imam, uh, his name is Sheikh Mansour here. And Sheikh Mansour is like uh, in the same lineage of Imam Shamil, meaning the same, the same groups of people, the same uh, mentors, if you like, that eventually become Imam Shamil's type of people. So that type of of, of combining a fierce uh, uh, affiliation with Islam along with anti-colonial uh, uh, jihad efforts. This is something that Dagestan is known for. Uh, eventually, Sheikh Mansour uh, was in fact uh, uh, captured uh, and sentenced to life in prison in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. Uh, this invasion was then followed by the main invasion that we are interested in, and this is called the, uh, the, the Qawqaz Wars, the Caucasian Wars, from 1817 to 1864, around 50 years, two, and, two generations almost, a generation and a half of constant uh, attempts uh, by Russia to conquer this entire region, uh, Dagestan and Chechnya and all of these regions. And eventually, I mean, of course, as we all know, eventually Russia did succeed in annexing this entire region and then making it part of the, uh, the Federation. By the way, some of the greatest, most horrible massacres, not greatest in that sense, meaning largest, I should say, some of the largest massacres of the, uh, of the 19th century took place at the hands of the Russians uh, with our Dagestan. Pakistani uh, brethren, uh, brothers and sisters. A lot of times we don't even know this type of stuff. It is estimated, by the way, that over a million and a half people lost their lives. 1.5 million people lost their lives in this brutal Russian invasion uh, against uh, Dagestan and also Chechnya, this entire uh, region. Dagestan and Chechnya are, of course, in the same uh, region. By the way, for those of you that are into arts and literature, the most famous Russian novelist of human history, Leo Tolstoy, the famous Tolstoy. Tolstoy, as a young man, participated in these invasions. Tolstoy wrote a number of uh, uh, um, books. In fact, his most famous book, if you should all know, War and Peace. You all know Tolstoy's War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy. War and Peace is based upon his experiences uh, fighting with uh, the, the, the Dagestan uh, uh, Muslims. And so uh, that, that is uh, just an interesting uh, tangent over here. Also, by the way, you know, the famous Winter Olympics of 20, of, sorry, of uh, yeah, 2014, 2014 took place in, in Sochi, right? That uh, Winter Olympics that took place in Sochi, uh, which is in, in, in Dagestan, that, that the stadium of the Winter Olympics uh, was built on one of the largest mass graveyards of Muslims uh, as a result of that massacre. Okay, so the Sochi massacre, it's called, uh, which took place uh, in the 1830 something or so, one of the largest massacres of that invasion. So the Olympic Stadium that took place in 2014, the Winter Olympics, it was built on that mass uh, uh, graveyard, as we said. Remember, 1.5 million people died. This is setting up the stage for what we're talking about Imam Shamil here. Imam Shamil is one of the main figures that is standing up and defending his people against this Russian uh, invasion. And Imam Shamil followed the footsteps of the earlier uh, movements, as we said, Sheikh Mansour and others. He's following their, uh, their efforts and he's reviving uh, and he's building from what they have done. Uh, we don't know that much details about Imam Shamil's early life because again, I mean, when he was born, nobody knew what would happen to him you know, later on. But we know that he was born in 1797. So around 1800, right? So around 200 years ago, to a relatively wealthy family. His father was a landlord, owned lots of lands, and this allowed him to send his son to the best education. And he trained his son in the best madrasas of the time. And so Imam Shamil grew up uh, in a very spiritual tradition, uh, going to the madrasas, learning the Quran. Also, he became friends with another major figure uh, who was to become the first, um, uh, if you like, uh, Amir of the jihad movement against um, against the Russians, and that is Ghazi Mullah. Uh, his name is Ghazi Mullah or Ghazi Muhammad, both of them. They're there. So Ghazi Mullah and Imam Shamil were childhood friends, and they grew up uh, together. And Imam Shamil was a young man, barely 19 years old, when the Russians invaded. And so he is seeing firsthand, and this is under Catherine, right? So uh, Catherine the Great, in her time frame, this is the second invasion that is taking place. And it is the one that is going to be eventually uh, annexing uh, this uh, region. So in 1817, uh, the Russians invade 
did. And uh, Imam Shamir is, of course, you know, barely a, a 19 years old at this time. And he sees firsthand the destruction, uh, the mayhem, the havoc that is that is being caused. Uh, unfortunately, the Qajar dynasty of Iran basically did nothing, even though nominally, nominally, uh, that dynasty was responsible. And then, of course, the Ottoman Sultan was eventually responsible, but they did not um, intervene. And so what did the Muslims of the Qawqaz region do? They decided to band together and fight uh, their own battle. Nobody else is going to help them. And so, believe it or not, this is something that is very interesting. They formed their independent emirate. This is called the Emirate of the Qawqaz or the Imamat al Qawqaz, right? This is a separate political entity that lasted for over 30 years. They formed, if you like, a new country or a new kingdom or a new emirate. And the goal of this emirate was to protect the Muslims against the invasion of the, uh, of the Russians. This is an independent stronghold, not following the Qajars or anybody else because nobody's helping them. And so if nobody's helping them, they need to just band together. And Imam Ghazi and Imam Shamil were the two main founders of this independent emirate. Uh, Emirate. And they set about uniting the various tribes. Now, again, don't want to get too technical here, but these regions, uh, Dagestan and Chechen and whatnot, they're actually composed of many uh, different minor, different ethnic, ethnic groups and tribes. It's not just one united group. And there's over 15 different ethnic groups and tribes in this region. And obviously, as you know, there's always politics between various groups of people. So Imam Shamil and Imam Ghazi began uniting these tribes under the banner of Islam. They persuaded them to give up their tribalism, their sectarianism, their differences between them. And they those that were not Muslims, they invited them to Islam. The majority were Muslim, as we said. And all also, another point here is that a lot of these tribes were far from the religion, and many of them had replaced the Sharia with their own laws. They called it Adat, Adat. Adat means our customs, our culture. They had their entire way of life. They called it Adat. And Imam Shamil, Imam Shamil and Imam Ghazi, they persuaded them to give up their Adat and to embrace the uh, Sharia. For example, one of the things is that the drinking of alcohol was rampant in those cultures. They considered it normal. It's nothing to be embarrassed about. Uh, many of the major vices that we now know, we know from the Sharia to Sharia to be vices, they didn't view them as being uh, problematic. They also did not do many of the things of Islam. So Imam Ghazi and Imam Shamil, the both of them, they began saying that the, just like before them, as we already mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sheikh Mansour and others before them, they began preaching that if they wanted to fight against the Russians, they would have to firstly unite and secondly follow the teachings of Islam. And this is a key point, brothers and sisters. They had a double agenda. Both of them combined together. Number one, to purify the Muslims from within, to make them observant Muslims, to make them pray fast, give up their sharab, their alcohol, give up their gambling was another major vice over there. And then number two, to unite to fight against the Russian uh, invasion. And so they were successful in that endeavor, and many tribes gathered together. And as I said, they founded the uh, the Imarat al Qawqaz or the 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 the, 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 the Caucasus, if you like, uh, Emirates. And they began defending their homelands and attacking uh, the Russian troops and the Russian fortresses and the Russian convoys. Of course, they had to in employ what is called guerrilla tactics because minority-wise, I mean, their numbers are nothing compared to the Russian army, and their and their um, weaponry is of course substandard. So, what do you do when a smaller group of people that doesn't have the weaponry has to defend themselves. They have to employ what is called guerrilla warfare uh, uh, tactics. And of course, there's a whiff of the early Sira. We find it over here as well. They made their capital in Ghimri, which is a major city in Dagestan, which is where Imam Shamil uh, was from. Uh, and it, uh, the Russians decided that they needed to eliminate uh, this, this emirate. So in 1832, in 1832, the Russians sent a massive force straight to Ghimri, and they surprise attacked uh, uh, Imam Shamil uh, uh, in, in his own city in Ghimri. And they, uh, it was one of the most devastating battles of the entire uh, time frame. And in fact, sadly, it is said that uh, the, the Muslims of Ghimri, pretty much all of them were massacred except for two people. Uh, and when the Russians entered the city, this is, by the way, this story that I'm about to tell you was printed in European newspapers 
newspapers at the time frame. Russian soldiers recorded it and they, they reported it to their superiors and European newspapers uh, mentioned the story that when the Russians entered the city in the dark of the night and they found the city quiet and dead, they, they thought everybody had died. All of a sudden, this massive figure appears silhouetted in the door. It's literally like coming out of a movie scenario. And the Russians stood there in shock. And the figure, the Russian soldier says, he leaped over the entire line of Russian soldiers and turned around and slaughtered three in one blow, in one blow of the left hand, he slaughtered three Russians. And the fourth Russian uh, charged towards this shadowy figure and plunged a bayonet into his body. And then unbelievably, and I, again, I read the article myself just to be sure that it's actually there. Uh, the Russian soldier said that he pulled the bayonet out of his own body. This is like you see this in Hollywood or something. He pulled the bayonet out and he then struck a blow and killed this last soldier, the fourth soldier. And then he turned around and he jumped over the city wall with one leap. He jumped over the city wall and uh, basically went into the, the night. That was Imam Shamil. Uh, that, uh, unfortunately, Ghazi, um, uh, Imam Ghazi died in this battle. So the leader died. Ghazi was the one that was in charge. In charge. Uh, they found his body, by the way, the Russians, as a, as a captain coming into the city. They found uh, Ghazi Muhammad. They found him sitting on his prayer rug, uh, bloody, bloodied and wounded, obviously. He must have been you know, wounded very severely. And so he rushed to his prayer rug and he died sitting there doing his dhikr in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say that his head was pointed you know, upwards, like in a, in a way, way that's not possible for a, a typical corpse, but his head was looking up and he's sitting in a dhikr position on his prayer rug. That's how the Russians uh, found him. And this uh, battle was a turning point for Imam Shamil because obviously with the death of Ghazi Muhammad, with the death of the main uh, you know, leader, so then eventually Imam Shamil is grudgingly, he didn't want to, but he's handed over the leadership of the jihad and of the resistance and of the Qawqaz Emirates, right? So he regroups, he makes a capital elsewhere, and he then takes on this responsibility. And it was under his leadership that the Emirate reached its actual zenith. At its peak point in time, the Qawqaz Emirates included all of Dagestan and modern Chechnya and even some neighboring uh, provinces. And Imam Shamil ruled for 27 years. 27 years he ruled, you know, after that uh, incident. And he became a great source of irritation for uh, the Russians. However, in the end of the day, the Russian forces, the Russian military, you know, the strength of the Russian army, obviously, how long can you continue to fight such a battle? He, he kept on getting, uh, you know, um, uh, defeated in small skirmishes. He had to run from place to place. And during this time frame, by the way, a lot of amazing stories are mentioned about Imam Shamil and about his people. I mean, there are legends that are said here. And these legends, obviously, they're, they're, they're passed from person to person. And, you know, perhaps there's a bit of an exaggeration. Allah knows best. But the point is the concept and the, the perception that people had of this uh, time frame is truly uh, amazing. Uh, it is said that um, during this time frame, so Imam Shamil gave a, a decree that anybody who drinks is going to be lashed you know, uh, the punishment of the Sharia is going to be uh, whipped, okay? Because this was a problem of, of, of drinking. And so an impetuous man who knew Imam Shamil from his youth and childhood, uh, he said that, you know, uh, why are you telling us this? You yourself used to drink you know, as a young man, and uh, your brother as well was a drunkard. Okay, so again, maybe this was true in the back. You know, before the before you know the Russians invaded or whatever. Maybe everybody is doing that back then. And so he's kind of like you know uh, riling him up. And so Imam Shamil called his brother, and himself administered. Uh, the punishment on his brother and then he handed the whip to his brother and then said you punish me for my previous sin of drinking and so he was lashed in front of the entire troops and then of course the troops understood that hey you know we cannot um, you know we cannot uh, continue this way there's another story that's also narrated that's even more subhanallah moving and emotional and it's really amazing again these are all these are all legends that are passed down and there's probably a kernel of truth to it or maybe even it's actually true we do not know that it is said that during one of these sieges and one of these, you know, uh, uh, difficult time frames, that uh, murmuring began amongst his troops that we should just surrender. We should just surrender and, you know, uh, give our luck to the to the Russians. At least we shall survive. And so Imam Shamil made a decree that anybody 
you know, who uh, is going to be talking of surrendering, that he's going to be lashed 100 times. Okay, anybody who's murmuring of surrendering is going to be lashed 100 times. And then it turns out that uh, his own mother might also have been talking about surrendering and whatnot. And so his mother was brought in front of him and they say, hey, she's the one that's also encouraging people to surrender maybe for their betterment of their lives or whatnot. Are you going to implement this had or not? And so, not had, but it should be ta'zir. So uh, he brought his mother in public and he brought the, the one that's going to do the whipping and to show the people. So he ordered the person to lift the whip up. But instead of his mother being whipped, he jumped in between his mother and the whip and he insisted that he would take the whip of his mother. He would be whipped uh, on behalf of his mother and he told the, the one who's whipping that I, I swear to you by Allah, if you don't whip the way you're supposed to, I will kill you. Don't be soft. Do it the way you're supposed to. And so he took on the, the blame or the whatnot and the soldiers after that there was no murmuring of you know giving up or of surrendering here and again all of this is very these stories really demonstrate the legend that is Imam uh, Shamil uh, it is also and again these, this is like a 30 year time frame lots of little stories mentioned here it is mentioned that by the Russians that once they attacked a small uh, town and they thought there may be, maybe be only a few hundred men over there and they were shocked to discover that every single man woman and even child they had had pledged to fight until death. And they were shocked to discover even young boys and young girls and women were armed and they were fighting them to death until they were forced to uh, withdraw with daggers, with homemade instruments to defend the, the town. So this time frame is a time frame where we hear the legends of the, the, the bravery of Dagestan and of the people of Dagestan and the Qawqaz and the Muslims, men, women, and children to defend their, their lives and their honor against the Russian uh, invasion. And during this time frame, Imam Shah really became legendary even amongst the Russians just like Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi so many years centuries ago also became legendary amongst the Frankish crusaders just like Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was respected by Richard the Lionheart of England he was respected as an adversary so too Imam Shamil became respected and also feared the people loved him and hated him at the same time I mean the Russians that they loved him as an enemy that as a noble enemy they admired who he was and they also feared him because of the ferocity and because of obviously the success of his uh, of his uh, campaigns against the Russians. And in fact, very interesting uh, footnote here, a number of prominent Russians actually defected from their army and they converted to Islam and they joined Imam Shamil's movements. Most famous amongst them is somebody we have his name as Haji Murad. That's all we know, Haji Murad. That he was a lieutenant or maybe a colonel in the Russian army and he defected and he embraced Islam and he became one of the main lieutenants of Imam Shamil. And this was one of the main causes as well of uh, basically, because he knew the tactics, he knew what's going on. So he became uh, basically a, a renegade from the Russians and a great uh, ally for the Muslims. Allah Azza wa Jal honored Islam you know, by his uh, conversion and a lot of khair came from from his conversion and his conversion really hurt the Russians. And again, going back to Leo Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy, again, all of you should know Leo Tolstoy is the famous Russian uh, intellectual and uh, author and historian. I mean, Tolstoy is the most famous Russian intellectual period, right? There's nobody more famous than Tolstoy. Tolstoy participated in these battles against Imam Shamit as a younger, as a younger person. And Leo Tolstoy actually writes another booklet. He has an entire novel about Haji Murad. Right? He has an entire novel dedicated to basically romanticizing the story, uh, which is published and you can find it in English um, as well. So Imam Shamil, as we said, proved to be a very big nuisance for the Russians. He impeded the Russian progress. But in the end of the day, you know, I mean, the Russians really were uh, superior technologically. They had more people and more manpower. How long can you continue to, to, to fight? Uh, so before I conclude, by the way, one more interesting incident, a uh, very long story, but a brief one minute summary that uh, in a particular instance, uh, Imam Shamil's sons were also fighting with him. In a particular instance, uh, the Russians, they, they promised uh, a type of 
um, uh, uh, a type of uh, amnesty to one of his sons by the name of Jamal al-Din. If he were to surrender and do this and that, they would do, you know, protect him and whatnot. And so when he gave him that surrender, the son Jamal al-Din, they, the Russians broke their promise and they took him as a prisoner and they marched him to St. Petersburg, okay? And they demanded that Imam Shamil surrender because they now had his son hostage, okay? They broke their word. They completely double stabbed and, and were treacherous. And they took uh, Imam Shamil's main son, who was the senior most, and fighting jihad and whatnot, they took him uh, as, a, as a prisoner and held him hostage. What did Imam Shamil do? Imam Shamil invaded one of the main uh, you know, cities of Russia and he captured two of the princesses of the Tsar's family. And uh, he held them hostage along with their entourage. And he demanded an exchange, you know, these two daughters for that one son of mine, right? Maybe the Sharia, <laughs> but uh, he took these two princesses and he demanded that, um, uh, you know, we're going to do a transfer and a swap over. And so the Russians acquiesced. And they sent, you know, um, Jamal al-Din back and he sent the, uh, the two princesses back. Interestingly enough, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the, uh, the, the princess's entourage, there was a French lady who was there, you know, the, what do you call the governess, right? That the takes care of them, teaches them, right? So she was also captured. Uh, and she then went back to France and she wrote a, 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 um, a booklet. She wrote her eyewitness experiences about uh, being with Imam Shamil. And that was printed, is still available in France in French. And uh, she praised the chivalry of Imam Shamil, the strictness of how they were protected. Nobody harmed them. Nobody did anything, you know, uh, to, to, to irritate or whatnot. Yes, he was very, you know, harsh and strict with everybody. But with these women, he made sure that they were protected. Their honor was protected and that they were then sent back and uh, 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 not mistreated. So this lady writes uh, her, her, her entire, uh, you know, I haven't read it, it's in French, but I mean, I've heard that it's there. Uh, and so you can read the, her own eyewitness um, account. Now, again, so much can be said, but as I said, in the end of the day, the Russians were of course, stronger militarily. You can't really, you know, I mean, no matter how much you have, yeah, and he, eventually the Russians are gonna, you know, um, overcome you. And so after decades of warfare, almost three decades, and by the way, the Russian tactics were brutal, massacre, wherever they went, as we said, 1.5 million people. One of the things also, they had a policy. So Imam Shamil and his group is, of course, they're, they're, they're well accustomed to living in the mountains and amongst the forests. So the Russians began chopping down the trees wherever they they want to have no cover for the uh, for the Muslims. And that was a brutal tactic because, you know, when you chop down the trees, you destroy nature, you destroy farmland, you destroy. And so they kept on doing this for decades and decades. It really proved to be very, very uh, brutal. And again, to be uh, to be a, a sad reality, subhanAllah, this 30 years war. And I have to say this, wallahi, it hurts to say not a single Muslim power outside helped them. Not the Ottomans, not the Qajars, nobody did anything. That nobody sent any aid to help the Muslims of this uh, region. And so what's going to happen? For how long can they uh, you know, continue? And eventually, Imam Shamil was forced to negotiate a, a surrender for at least allowing the rest of the people to live and not be massacred. And so after all of these years, he felt, and you know, really, that Allah knows best is... Yani, what are you going to say at this stage? You know, I mean, maybe it is best to allow the people to live and not just to be killed to the last person. And so in 1859, look at how many years have gone by. In 1859, he willingly surrenders and uh, negotiates a peace treaty uh, for the rest of his people. And uh, as a part of the surrender, he has to obviously go under uh, arrest and whatnot. So he is taken to St. Petersburg in Russia, where the Tsar himself insists on meeting Imam Shamil. Can you believe like the leader of the Russians, the royal, the, the king of the Russians, the Tsar he's called, right? He wants to meet Imam Shamil. Can you believe? That's the honor that he already has heard of Imam Shamil. He, he wants to meet him. And after he meets Imam Shamil, of course, he has to be arrested, but he gives him uh, basically an apartment, not the prison. And he gives him a stipend and he gives many conditions, but he allows him to live under house arrest. Okay. So as an honor to Imam Shamil, he's not executed and he's not sent to the main prison. He's actually given a house arrest, you know, in St. Petersburg. He's not allowed to go back to Dagestan. So he has to remain over there. And for 10 years, he was treated as a house arrest, basically, uh, in, in, in St. Petersburg. In 1869, Imam Shamil uh, asks, petitions the czar that let me do hajj now. Let me do hajj. I have not done hajj here. And so in 1869, 
the czar granted him permission to do Hajj. And so he began his travel uh, by taking a, a boat to Istanbul, where the Sultan of the Ottomans, the Sultan, the Khalifa of the Muslims, basically wanted to meet him. And he housed him in his own house as... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> I'm still recovering from a flu, by the way. This is not COVID related, don't worry. Uh, inshallah, it got tested, but it's um, I had a flu for the last week. Uh, may Allah give shifa to all of us. Amen. So he housed him for an entire you know week or two, the, 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 the Sultan, the Khalifa, and gave him honor and karam and whatnot. And then he continued onwards to Mecca. In Mecca, he met uh, the great Mujahid and Alim and warrior Abdul Qadir al Jazairi. Wallahi, how we wish we had a, uh, some eyewitness or picture or something. Two great leaders of the time frame. Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, if you don't know who is Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, then Wallahi, you guys need to study Abdul Qadir al Jazairi as well. He was the leader of the resistance in, in Algeria against the French, right? And here we have Imam Shamil, leader of the resistance against the Russians. And the two of them meet in the house of Allah under the shade of the Kaaba. Wallahi, what a beautiful religion this is, where people like this are united in their Iman, in their Kalima, in the rituals of Hajj. This is what Islam does. So they met over there, they embraced one another. I wish we had more information. I have not been able to discover much more of their conversation. At least seems to be lost here. Nonetheless, they stayed together in Mecca for a while. They performed the Hajj. And then Imam Shamil uh, moves on to Medina as we should all do after doing Hajj is good to go to Medina and subhanallah you know he passes away in Medina and he is buried in Baqir al-Gharqad he is buried in Baqir al-Gharqad and subhanallah what a beautiful uh, ending uh, that is by the way a, a side point here uh, and that is that while he was in jail in St. Petersburg he would compose poetry and it is said, and this is really interesting. I actually looked this up and I confirmed this on the other side. You listen to this story. Very interesting. It is said that as he was saying some poem, moving poem about how he misses his homeland, about how he wishes he was back home and whatnot, and he's under a prisoner here, that a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, was passing under the street and he heard that poem. And he was so moved that he wrote the poem down and then made a version in his own language. And it was then adopted by a movement of Judaism known as the, the, the Chabad movement, C-H-A-B-A-D. It is a strand of Orthodox Judaism. And so this was a famous rabbi that was one of the founders of that movement. He adopted it. And to this day, that poem that it's now it wasn't. So again, this is a poem that is based on Imam Shamil, but it is also the rabbi is putting in his own language, and his own thing. But that poem is used as a part of the literature of the Jewish Orthodox Chabad movement to this day. It is still recited by the movement in New York, in Brooklyn. Well, you know, the so the Orthodox, they wear their caps and whatnot. That is part of the Chabad movement. So they are the ones who took a poem from Imam Shamil and they it was such a moving poem about exile and about loneliness and about being away from home and family and whatnot. And that became a part of their vernacular that they use to this um, day. So we now conclude with uh, seven points of benefit, okay, from the story. And of course, much more, but time is limited. First and foremost of the benefits of Imam Shamil's story is that Imam Shamil was a, one of a series of great luminaries that came in the same time and frame to do very similar things to protect his people against the onslaught of the, uh, of the Russians. And this shows us, point number one, that no person works alone. You need a team, you need a people, you need those around you to help you. One person cannot build an empire. Empire. Yes, you need a mover and a shaker, but there are people that are involved that are behind the scenes. If you look at Imam Shamil's life, there are people that go back a hundred years that are doing the same thing and that even continued after him. So Imam Shamil was definitely the most famous and he was definitely the great luminary, but he was not isolated. You need people and you need support as Imam Shamil had. Number two, another point that we learn here is that spiritual victory does not necessarily, maybe even typically, equate to political victory. To be victorious does not mean that you win the physical battle. I believe Imam Shamil won, even though he didn't win politically. I believe Imam Shamil is a victor, even though he lost politically to the Russians. You see, the point here is that as Muslims, we need to think beyond just beyond just uh, this world as well. Of course, we want political victory. I'm, I'm not trivializing that. And that is why the Prophet is the Prophet, because he has the double victory, the spiritual and the political. But in 
case, I'm saying in case we do not achieve the political after trying it, that does not make us failures. That does not mean it was for naught. On the contrary, true leadership and true victory is attained by one's manners and akhlaq and one's life. And it, not just the outer manifestations of the political victory. Suppose the czar won the battle. Nobody knows the name of the czar. We all know the name of Imam Shamil. Imam Shamil's legacy lives on. And this leaves us to point number three. And that is that just because you don't win the political victory, it doesn't mean the struggle was in vain. No one should think that Imam Shamil wasted 30, 40 years you know, fighting the Russians. On the contrary, there are many benefits that came out of it. People embraced Islam. There were people that converted that were non-Muslims. The Islamic spirit was revived amongst the Dagestanis before Imam Shamil, before the Jihad. Generally speaking, they were far from the deen, but this brought them back to Islam. And so we have to look beyond just a political victory. Just because there was no you know, Qawqaz Emirates that became permanent, we should not think that those 30, 40 years were in vain. The Islamic da'wah, the movement of Islam, the moving and shaking of my ideas and minds, even if it does not result in political uh, victory, there is much khair and benefit that comes out of it. And just because we don't attain worldly ends, it doesn't mean that we neglect the spiritual ends. Number four, point number four here is that legend are not born but made in their lifetime when Imam Shamil was born nobody knew what would happen nobody knew what that he would become who he would become in fact even Imam Shamil did not want to he he did not that's why when the emirate was formed he turned it down he gave it to his friend Ghazi he didn't want it it was necessity that forced it on him and when it was forced on him what happened he rose up to the challenge and he became the greatest leader of the Qawqaz emirates your legacy is what you do with what you have there are plenty of other people out there and if you take the 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 best uh, of your circumstances and you make the best out of it that is how leadership is formed so true leaders and true legacy builders. They're not people that are just born into privilege and rank and fame. They make the best that they can with their destiny by Allah's will and qadr. And this is the reality with every mover and shaker from Khalid ibn al-Wali to Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi to Imam Shamil, all of these people, when they're born and they're young, they're, they have no clue what's going to happen, but you keep on raising the bar. You keep on making the best of your circumstances. And by the time you finish your life, you look back and that's Allah's blessings on you that you've accomplished much. So you make the best of your uh, situation. Point number five, we also learned from Imam Shamil that again, to be a respected leader, you lead by example and not just by speech. May Allah forgive all of us. This is one of our big problems. We talk too much and not enough action. Imam Shamil didn't just talk. He he didn't just give da'wah, he demonstrated what it meant. And again, the stories that I just told you of taking the, the, the pain himself, standing between him and his mother, you know, taking the, the whipping for drinking when he was a child, whatever. How, what do you think the people felt, right? Can you imagine when they saw that, okay, Imam Shamir is being whipped because his mother was talking about surrender and he's taking the whip. Who's going to talk about surrender after that, right? True leaders lead by example, by their akhlaq, by what they do. And again, his son is being held hostage, being tortured. When he takes the two princesses, he does nothing. He protects them. He makes sure that his army does not harm a hair on their head because you lead by example. His people are being massacred by the Russians. Never once did he massacre innocent Russian peasants. He never did that. He never targeted innocent civilians the way that the Russians targeted his people. That, and again, by the way, Abdul Qadir al-Jizadi as well, the same thing, by the way, that he also never killed innocent people just because the French were killing uh, his uh, people. Uh, point number six here is that subhanAllah, how can we not, wallahi, how can we not feel jealous at a beautiful death? Wallahi, what a legacy, an entire lifetime of da'wah and of jihad, and then asking permission to go for the hajj, and then performing the hajj, and then in Medina to be buried in Baqi al Gharqad. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla for Dafan in Baqi al Gharqad to be buried over there. SubhanAllah. What a life. What an end of time. What a beautiful to finish any khitamu who missed, right? To finish upon uh, having performed the one and only hajj that he did and then we're, we're making his way to Medina and being buried in Baqi al Gharqad. Wallahi, this is from Allah Azza wa Jalla. You cannot, Wallahi, you cannot buy this for a million, for a billion dollars. This is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he was gifted and his body is still in Baqi al Gharqad. So this shows us, inshallah ta'ala, you know, the ikhlas and the good that is there. And the final point, inshallah, and I apologize if I went over time, I'm not sure about my time. The final no, point, inshallah ta'ala, and then I'll I'll hand it back to our esteemed Mashaykh. 
And again, I'm sorry to be so blunt here, but wallahi, we have to stop being politically correct. I, met, I left out a very controversial issue because I wanted to mention it right now. Imam Shamil, Imam Shamil was a Naqshabandi sheikh. Imam Shamil was a leader in the tariqah of the Naqshabandiyya. And he had adhkar that are in the silsila of the Naqshabandiyya. And bay'ah was given to him in the silsila of the Naqshabandiyya. And he was a person who combined his version of tasawwuf with pure Islam, with fighting against uh, the, the colonizers and the, uh, and the uh, Russians here. Why am I saying this? Because, dear brothers and sisters, wallahi, one of the biggest problems that we have is the narrow-mindedness of sectarianism. The narrow-mindedness of my firqa versus the other firqas. That we cannot see beyond how a person is doing some of the smaller things, some of the minutia of their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what? I'll be brutally honest here. Many people would have considered Imam Shamil to be mubtadir in our times. Many people would say that, oh, he is naqshabandi, he's doing this and his dhikr is this, is doing that. But subhanAllah, I'm not here to debate who's right and wrong. I'm saying we need to be brave and frank enough to admit that, you know what? Nobody can doubt the courage, the sincerity, to be brutally honest as far as we can even say, and Allah knows best, his iman and taqwa. We can disagree with his interpretation of Islam. But let not that disagreement blind us to what we have in common with Imam Shamil. Let, not, let us not be so sectarian that we cannot see beyond the firqa that he belongs to. Throughout his life, Imam Shamil was a naqshabandi from birth until death. His father was a part of the silsila. He became the sheikh of the silsila, by the way. I didn't mention this because I wanted to mention it at this time. He, he did not separate his naqshabandi identity from, his, from, from who he was. And subhanAllah. Subhanallah, he, now we have time, uh, you know, groups that they would not be able to see beyond the fact that he belongs to a different uh, firqa. You know what, dear brothers and sisters, wallahi, yani, what can be said here? I mean, those who look up to Ibn Taymiyyah, those who look up to Ibn Taymiyyah, they need to follow Ibn Taymiyyah. When the Mongols invaded, when the Tatars invaded, Ibn Taymiyyah, we all know he was a great Sheikh al-Islam. He was very harsh against Ahlul Kalam, the Tasawwuf and whatnot. But when the Mongols invaded outside of Damascus, he didn't care who is an Ash'ari, who is a Sufi, who is a whatnot. He understands that we are all Muslims against the Mongols. He understands that these types of discussions, there's a time, there's a place, there's an audience. So to be brutally clear here, I am not trivializing the differences, but I am saying, too many amongst us have made these differences the priority. I am the first person to say, wallahi, these are important issues. Let's talk about the reality of bid'ah. Let's talk about how we should do adhkar. But let's use the right audience, the right language, the right platforms. And let us not use these differences to make us even more disunited. We have to have a wisdom in how we talk about these things, in the language that we use, and even in the audiences that we preach it in. And this is something that brutally honest, wallahi, it is lacking amongst many people, sometimes even many scholars, about what is the reality of the ummah happening and you are worried about who's an Aqshabandi and who's a Salafi and who's an Ash'ani and whatnot. Wallahi, this is not the time or the place to go public on these issues. So we're talking about Imam Shamil. Many of those that are talking about him now, if he were alive now, you know, they would be saying different things about him because they have a difference in how he practiced certain adhkar and whatnot. So my point is very, very simple, dear brothers and sisters, and that is that Yes, indeed, there is a time and place to talk about our internal differences, but we also need to see what unites us. And we also need to understand that, you know, there are things more important. And that is, where is your wala? Where is your iman? Where, who do you really love in the end of the day? If you love Allah and his messenger, and if you want the deen of Allah to be superior, then wallahi, we can look apart and we can overlook many, many differences in the face of the onslaught that is happening. If your wala is to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala and you want this deen to be successful then inshallah ta'ala i'm begging you that if that is the case that is your brother in islam even if you disagree with many of the details even if you don't necessarily see eye to eye but in the time that we live in with the onslaught taking place wallahi how can we make these differences the biggest of all imam shamil was a great alim and a great uh, mujahid and he was a naqshabandi sufi and so be it that is the reality and we respect him not in spite 
spite of it, but because of it. We respect mm. him because he was a person who wanted to revive this deen in the way that he saw best. And his hisab is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this, I ask Allah azza wa jal to... Forgive me if I said anything wrong. Sheikh Haytham mm. and others are here. They can correct if any, uh, you know, if any, uh, any issues come here. But uh, this was what I had in mind. And inshallah, mm. we'll hand it back to our uh, organizers. Zakumullah khair. <laughs> روحا وريحانا بقولك كون